Okay. Um, hello and welcome to the first podcast for 2024. And today I have the pleasure to have Shivaji with us. Uh, he is a civil geophysicist and has been working extensively for past many years in velocity modeling, seismic interpretation. And he has also uh, worked in AIML applications in geosciences. I hope this first podcast brings new perspective in New Year and uh, everyone enjoys it. So Shivaji, uh, thanks so much. We've been uh, talking for a while and finally, it's great to have you here. Welcome. Thank you, Tanishta. And thank you for the introduction. Yeah, I have been uh, in the industry for almost close to 20 years now. Um, I studied and uh, studied mainly in India in uh, from the University for my bachelor's, then IIT Bombay. But uh, since then, I have been mostly working with uh, a company called CGG, and uh, it has been uh, my longest stint. And recently, I just moved companies. So, in during all that uh, experience or uh, that time, I have been working a lot of different fields. Mm -hmm. But as I just mentioned, uh, working in a lot in the velocity model building. So. If you think about what we are doing in in terms of geoscience, uh, like in like per day or in a day sort of a thing, um, it can be quite repetitive in some ways, and in many ways it can be uh, very interesting as well. And if it's up to you as an individual to understand and uh, and find the the passion essentially. And I'm. Mm -hmm. I've been very passionate about geoscience and uh, geophysics in particular, but geoscience as a whole. And uh, I think that that kind of uh, reflects in the fact that I have been doing hardcore geophysics for for such a long time and uh, almost at the leading edge of technology everywhere. So, yeah, yeah I think that's that has been my my major mainstay. And uh, uh -huh. I hope yeah, so um, uh, maybe uh, let's talk a little bit more of geophysics, right? Um, so how is how is the maybe because we have been in that industry for twenty years, how has it changed? I'd say like um, in terms of um, like I know even we studied a long back back in uh, undergrad, but are has there a lot of been changes as more data is coming in or more inform more uh, in like. Uh, technologies have come up so has it changed a little bit yes. right i think when we started in uh, about a few 20 years ago um at that time already people were actually people have been asking this question about the peak oil or the end of the oil era and do we have enough resources and or not and this is a cyclic mm -hmm. thing. we're just about starting in the phase where that cycle was coming back up and people were starting to realize that we have to do more exploration, find more oil and things like that. So every time that particular question has been asked, there is a new technology or new advancements in science that comes in to, to help the, mm -hmm. or the geoscientists to discover more difficult resources or, or uh, let's say more complicated uh, areas, right. new place. So when we started, a lot of the projects that we did were still doing uh, dip move out corrections and stacking and post stack migrations, uh, maybe a lot of 2D work. Mm -hmm. and since in, the, in, in those years, I think uh, we have moved almost entirely to 3D. There is still a lot of 2D being shot, uh, mainly like exploration basis um, in new frontier areas, but almost all um, major explorations have moved to 3D. Mm -hmm. uh, DMO and DMO stack I think a lot of people do not do that anymore uh, people probably in the new geophysics are not even sure of how to do that uh, in practice maybe theoretically is possible and uh, we have seen the advent of uh, uh, kind of more automated approaches or data driven approaches uh, starting mm -hmm. with some inversion to more complicated uh, solutions of the wave equation, to uh, reverse time migration for imaging. Uh, it has become more and more complicated. So 
normal 3D went into full azimuth 3Ds and wide azimuth and multi multi vessel acquisitions. Mm. Just of uh, reducing cost, I think we have seen a lot of uh, blended acquisitions uh, coming up to reduce cost of acquisition. But uh, the moment you have got blended new acquisition, uh, blended acquisition or reduce the cost of the acquisition, new acquisition methods become more viable and the cost again goes up. So we are doing more and more of ocean bottom nodes and uh, very high density acquisitions. When we started, uh, I think the traditional fold was around that 40 or 48 fold with maybe four and a half kilometer offset or something like that, or even, even less than four and a half kilometer offset. Uh, to, to nowadays when we are look, when we are talking about ultra long offsets of eighteen kilometers, twenty four kilometers, and things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, where I'm working right now, they are they, that is the domain of very high fold uh, data sets. So we are we are no longer forty folds. We are more like four thousand folds. So it has gone up by a factor of two essentially or, or magnitude of two essentially mm -hmm. so, which is where uh, a lot of uh, complex data crunching data compression and uh, cost savings and more complicated acquisitions start to come into play and uh, mm -hmm. the more data we acquire the more data driven processes are become more feasible like like full waveform inversion and things like that which play a, a huge role in uh, in advanced velocity model building nowadays mm. okay and um yeah so then um maybe i'll my next question would be and that's kind of uh the theme of this podcast is uh uh the machine learning and deep learning approaches that you are using uh i i i think you have also been using this for a while right so right. if you can give um Maybe uh, one of the thing, let's start with a data challenge. Um, maybe the, because I know it's a lot of noise in uh, the seismic data. How are we uh, uh, including that? Are we uh, in, are we cleaning it for AI ML models or we are not doing that? How does it work looking like that now? Okay. Actually, uh, geophysics as a, as a science actually, probably has been using machine learning or machine learning methods for a very long mm -hmm. time. Just recently that we have started tagging it as machine learning. So we right. talk about <laughs> linear regressions, or you talk about uh, single value decompositions and things like that. Those have been in like, we have been using that forever actually. And uh -huh. um, only recently they have gone into the, or being started being tagged as being machine learning programs. Right. Thing essentially, so as as I said, the data volume has been increasing. So there is a lot of emphasis on using uh, AI or ML, mainly mach machine learning uh, methods, right. more um, to try and reduce the uh, the man or uh, man hours or the human intervention, essentially to try and reduce that as much as possible. So. Um, in terms of machine learning, it has a lot of uh, applications of machine learning which are easy to do are uh, kind of more focused on the interpretation side, like picking faults or interpreting horizons, uh, picking top of salt, uh, things like that, mm -hmm. top of and things like that. That's the the low hanging fruits, if you want. Mm. Um, in seismic processing, I think those low hanging fruits are the denoise programs essentially because you have got uh, mm. like well established denoise programs that can at, at least create that data set where which you can use to uh, create labels and things like that. So like a supervised learning and things like that become much more easier mm -hmm. for uh, for that sort of uh, noise estimation and noise uh, removal. But uh, nowadays we are really talking about physics informed neural networks and, and uh, sort of UNETs and things like that to do even beyond uh, beyond traditional denoise to mm -hmm. load more complicated um, kind of say multiple model subtractions or uh, trace reconstructions and things like that. Those are those are things which um, which are going to be the future and they are already being 
used quite a quite a bit, but uh, we're even looking at uh, creating initial velocity models for FWI or QCing F, uh, full waveform inversion using machine learning, where uh, uh, whether whether the uh, gradient function is going in the right direction or is it stuck in a local minima can be QCed yeah. using machine learning. And if you think about FWI, we are talk we actually talk about gradient functions and local minima, which are also the same terminology that you are actually using for machine learning. Yeah, machine learning. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in ways, FWI program itself is or can be considered as a as a function of um, machine learning or as a type of machine learning. But mm -hmm. right now, that that gap between uh, pure FWI and machine learning driven FWI is because is getting narrower and narrower, and we are looking at a a, a, a situation where. People mm -hmm. have started to talk about whether we can do uh, FWI do using machine learning programs altogether. That's actually, and yeah. I think it's really something which is uh, too far away. It's probably coming up in the next. It, I am sure it's there a lot in the in the research, and I have been reading a few papers which have which are starting to scratch the surface of that quite uh, yeah. quite significantly. Right. But in the very near future, I think that's going to become a reality. Um, Similar things for uh, imaging algorithms, for example, like travel time computation using machine learning that is becoming very common or becoming uh -huh. uh, something that is easily easily doable. Um, image enhancement, post imaging, like post migration imaging enhancements to reduce migration, reduce reduce migration swings. Um, uh, do additional demultiple, denoise, footprint acquisition, footprint removal things. These are things which are which are kind of easy to do, and the moment you include some sort of a physics in, into it, it becomes even more easier and uh, more mm -hmm. stabilized, more constrained. Right. So those are things that are that are happening, and uh, I think we will see more and more of that uh, as more research institutes, yeah. uh, companies start to invest in that. Right. Yeah. So it's um. I I I was uh maybe not too related, but uh when um like fluid flows are con uh, considered like the Navier Stokes equations, right? So a lot of uh good uh, research are coming up uh, where you are putting this uh, physics constraint to this, right? Yeah. So I think this is um quite a big huge topic now coming up and um. Another question I really wanted to ask, how how well do you think you still need human in the loop, even after you have all the QCing done? Um, uh, it, I, I, I'm pretty sure it cannot be completely avoided, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So how well, is, how, how are you looking at that in terms of uh, uh, imaging or anything? So the moment we ask that question, we are coming to that boundary between like pure machine learning and AI actually, and uh, you you start to think about what can AI bring in, mm. and uh, where mainly the human interaction comes in, or where the human uh, involvement comes in, is to actually think about the solution in a lateral sense, things which have not been shown, or you you probably look at or think about or hear about a solution, say, in the medical field and think, okay, this can be applied in geophysics. Or mm. like uh, quite a few years ago, I was reading a paper on uh, what sort of a denoise is being done uh, for uh, to clean up the satellite images better, essentially. Mm -hmm. So that same program then can be utilized for geophysics. And we did that and it's actually, it, it gives quite a, quite a good result as well. So uh, it's about the lateral thinking or the lateral logic that a human brings, uh, brings bring in, that's going to be the major factor. And I think that's where the human intervention or human involvement is going to become mm -hmm. more important rather than doing the day-to-day -day, uh, day -day job. We are even looking at LLMs, right now which can even predict the best parameter for for a particular program and things like that so we are mm. we're still getting into that that zone where whatever is done 
if you are just replicating that or remembering that and utilizing that, that part machines can do already. So humans need to start uh, thinking beyond that and start. Actually, that's probably the the role of AI and ML in any case, where they yeah. do the day to day work so that humans can can think kind about... of the assistant, right? Yes. Yeah, or 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 dump your knowledge to him. <laughs> I kind of like that, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and you do not, I I guess you do not lose the knowledge when people leave companies. Or right. Mm -hmm. Do not, are they retired or whatever happens essentially. So I think that that knowledge base, uh, creation of that knowledge base, I think is, is what is the main main function mm -hmm. and utilizing yeah. the repetitive knowledge for repetitive tasks. But new tasks, new challenges, I'm sure humans will still play a, a huge role in, in even telling whether that model has been trained properly or not. It's not just statistics, you know, like you, you kind of need to apply it and, and see whether it's actually a cat or a dog and not really all cats will look like cats and all dogs may not look like dogs essentially. So a human has to step in and say, okay, actually that doesn't look like yeah. a dog, actually a dog, so yeah. Right. Yeah, so um, quite interesting. Uh, so uh, uh, maybe uh, we can come to the last segment. I know you wanted to discuss the future of geoscience. So it, let's say that you have dumped all your knowledge to the AI. Now, where uh -huh. do you want to <laughs> proceed from here? <laughs> you look at new frontiers, essentially. Thanks yeah. to that. We kind of started to look at already. Companies have been looking at uh, exploring for, say, hydrogen and helium mm. and things. These are kind of new new energy sources that we are kind of starting to explore. Um, I know, uh, sorry to interrupt, um, hydrogen still I have some knowledge, helium. Uh, how is helium exploration, uh, like, how does it work? Uh, like, as a geophysicist, I cannot connect right now. Right, right. It's also something new that I have just uh, uh, read or, or heard about in the last few days or so. So it's some. I'm not really qualified at this point, at this moment to to tell you mm -hmm. more. But these are things that are that are going to come up, and uh, like you, you, we have seen Ray, we are coming into a, a crunch of minerals essentially. So, um, where is the next source of minerals? Um, and something that I have been myself kind of quite passionate about is how geoscience is going to start looking at outside the earth rather than inside the earth. And we are looking at like space exploration and we're looking at asteroids and mete okay. exploring meteors and even even moon or, or Mars for uh, min mining and mineral exploration uh, to bring in these um, rare earth elements and uh, kind of uh, hard to find elements or minerals that we really re require to uh, to boost the next next phase of energy utilization or or exploration of mankind. I think that's that's where geoscience is going to play a part, a play a role. And it's not just engineering and mining challenges. It's not just space. Uh, mm, right. Robotics is going to be also what once you are in space, what do you do essentially? And what you do is you explore, and what you explore is is basically a, a, a function of geoscience. Yeah. You know, like I think it was like 25, 30 years back or something like that. There was this um, Armageddon, even old movies, they start, they mm, actually right. that. You need to have a geologist on board, you know. Like so, it's uh, it's not a new concept. Uh, it's something that mm. people have used for a long time, and uh, just we have to stop thinking about just looking at Earth. We probably have to look at beyond Earth next. And I think the new generation that's coming up or that's starting to study geoscience, they will definitely play a role in mm. exploring beyond Earth. And uh, I think that's something that we will see in our lifetimes. And I'm really excited and on that particular mm. aspect. Yeah, it's like uh, different moon missions, like not even our moon, maybe like Jupiter's exactly. trees and all these, yeah. Mm. Um, I, I wanted to ask you uh, one thing. How do you, what do you think about the um, uh, geothermal energy? Like, is mm. it um, is it a next big thing? 
or because it's still going on and um, I think and many many countries have started to look at it although you have to realize that uh, quite a few countries probably do not have as much geo yeah. geothermal um, mm -hmm. resource needed so it's definitely not going to replace uh, oil and gas as a as an energy source but definitely will be a part of the energy mix for sure and mm -hmm. uh, I think we probably do not understand the whole capacity of the geothermal yet. And there is every few months I, I hear a new idea coming up, starting from uh, naturally occurring geothermal vents to uh, injecting uh, injecting saline water into uh, existing in existing oil wells to heat it up and bring it back in and use utilize that for as an energy source and things like that. So I think the involvement in of geoscience will be limited to a certain extent. Uh, I think finding uh, the the source of the geothermal uh, energy and then also to to monitor the pathways and things like that. Uh, if we are uh, fracturing or injecting into fractures, then monitoring whether the the fluids actually <laughs> go into the right uh, right places. Mm -hmm. so there will be. Definitely some uh, involvement. Uh, we are talking about geothermal, so it's definitely something that uh, geophysicists or geoscientists will be involved in. Mm -hmm. But I do not see it playing a, a, a huge part in the energy mix. It's it's going to be a I part see. of not, mm -hmm. maybe. So yeah, that's at least my my feeling at this moment. Uh, but mm -hmm. change, and uh, we may start to see other. I think there yeah. there are related fields to geothermal like a lot of geothermal activity is related to lithium deposits and lithium is an important mineral right now that we are looking yeah, at yeah for batteries at least yeah mm -hmm. so it could have some lateral some kind of a associated uh, effects or have associated impacts uh, where geophysics or geophysicists may may start to uh, start to play a role mm. uh, but it's going to be a more of a, a kind of a holistic geoscience rather than just geophysics uh, it has to be geologists uh, satellite imagery uh, satellite uh, imaging people uh, remote sensing people geophysics geophysicists uh, multiphysicists essentially like um, with people who are looking at uh, electromagnetics and uh, geo uh, um, uh, gravity and things like that so all, all those things kind of need to all those um, domains need to come together to uh, to really see the potential of geothermal in the future. Mm. Kind of related to that is will be the probably the next big thing is going to be the going to be kind of like sweet water exploration actually. So <laughs> that's probably where where we'll start to see more and more um, companies investing. So those could be okay. related. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. For sure. <laughs> Uh, so I think uh, we did uh, cover a lot of topics. Thanks, Shivaji, uh, for uh, for this nice podcast. And I think uh, with this, uh, we will end. And uh, thanks once again, Shivaji, for, for your really good insights. Thank you for having me, Tanishta. It was good to speak to you and Vishal as well. And I'm, I'm hoping that these uh, ideas and discussions do pave the path for new geoscientists to get new ideas and explore more, become mm -hmm. more passionate about the subject that I'm very, very passionate about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I still feel that many young geophysicists think it's oil and gas. It's beyond that, definitely. It's beyond oil and gas. Yeah. Yeah. There's many other things to do as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you both. Bye-bye.